Welcome everyone. This is David Morgan of TheMorganReport.com and today I am going to have a discussion with Stephen Lieb of the complete, the editor of The Complete Investor and he also is a, is a money management firm and we've been uh, actually talking back and forth on LinkedIn and uh, you know occasional emails and that type of thing for a while. And we finally were able to uh, connect and then uh, had a long talk. And I said, I've got to put you on my podcast because there's a lot of crossovers between you and from the standpoint of being on the East Coast, a New Yorker, and me being <laughs> one of those cowboys way out west. But we have a lot of commonality. So during our discussion, we talked about many things, mostly financial and current events. And I brought up my mission statement to teach and empower people the benefits of an honest financial system. And you know, I know you really enjoyed hearing that that's my mission. Right? Gold isn't my mission. Silver isn't my mission. Honest money might be a subset of an honest financial system. So why don't we start there as far as kind of your background, because you have quite one. You've written several books. I'm a subscriber to Complete Investor. In fact, when people say, hey, I don't want to specialize in the resource sector, which is what I do. I have a specialty letter. You have the Complete Investor. And I say, well, who should I get? That would be overall to get the complete investor. That's the one to get. So anyway, back to you. Give us a little background well, thanks, and uh, tell us your current take on the financial market or how you got here. D David, I mean, my current take, I, I, I think I would be repeating you. I mean, uh, I, I saw The Four Horsemen and I have to say it was one of the uh, two best documentaries I've ever seen. And I'm not a young guy and I've seen a lot of documentaries and it was revelatory it really was uh that you know there are, it took me longer than it took you guys that put together that film to, to to realize what was going on i mean i sort of basically realized that something was up with america that that it wasn't the same thing and i wrote a book in uh 20 was it 10 or 11 called red alert which was to point out how fast China was gaining on the U.S. And I followed that with another book about 10 years later uh, called uh, The Rise of China and the New Age of Gold. Uh, because it, And basically, it, it just said, we've done nothing. We've ac absolutely done nothing. And China has done a lot of things. That wasn't the mission of the book. The mission of the book was that Gold, which I recommended strongly, well, I have actually been recommending gold very strongly since uh, the turn of the century. Um, uh, Defying the Market was a book that I wrote in 1999. And it shows you, I mean, it was, it, it's, timing is everything in America. It was like about six months before the bubble crashed and the book went nowhere, but it did, you know, <laughs> it got not, not nice reviews and things like that. But if I if it had come out six months later, it would have been a lot better. But there, I basically said that our, you know, our technologies were not going to solve the problems that we're going to face in the next century. I'm just going to tell you what I did right in the book. I'm not going to mention anything that was wrong. So don't get the idea that I, <laughs> that I, I did. It was a perfect book, but it wasn't. But, you know, one of the things it really focused on was that the technologies that we had at that time, they're basically the same technologies we have today, except today we're a little bit faster, were not up for uh, dealing with the problems we were likely going to face in the uh, 21st century, which were resource scarcities. And uh, you just couldn't face them with, uh, you know, the, the internet, and the information technologies were not the kinds of things that were going to do it. We were doing a little work with fusion. We still are. We were doing work with superconductivity. And I actually made a bet. And I almost lost a client. He, he, he's a guy at MIT, has his own lab there. And I bet him that superconductivity, which had just been uh, room temperature superconductivity, I think had been discovered in 1986. And it was, you know, the great hope of the future because we get that room temperature, you know, uh, that, that, that temperature a little bit higher. It wasn't really room temperature. I'm sorry. 
it was above absolute zero, somewhere between room temperature and absolute zero. If you got it to room temperature, you, you would be able to uh, transmit electricity without losing anything at all. Now, you know, it, I bet this fellow, we're not gonna do it. It, it. 20 years from now, we will still not have room temperature superconductivity. And I would have won the bet. It's not one that I wanna collect on because you know he's still a client. So I don't remind him of that. And he knows tons, tons more physics. I, I promise you, I couldn't even, you know, it was just my sense of, how we do things. I mean, there used to be a time in this country um, where we had a laboratory, we had several laboratories, but the most important one was Bell Labs. And it was remarkable what Bell Labs had done. Uh, uh, you know, in, in conjunction with the government, in conjunction with, you know, top university re researchers, they had basically created modern technology as we know it today. The transistor was invented at Bell Labs as an example. So was, you know, uh, superconductivity uh, near absolute zero. So was the laser. So was the internet. The basis for the internet was invented at, at Bell Labs at, in, in conjunction with uh, DARPA at the government, you know, uh, part of the uh, Defense Department, the research part of the Defense Department. It, it, it was just an extraordinary uh, uh, laboratory, an extraordinary research uh, establishment. And, you know, the reason it works so well, it combined the best of capitalism and uh, the best of research. It put it all in one package and the way it did that is we had a monopoly in those days called AT&T. It's not the same AT&T that we have today. And uh, that was AT&T in those days was considered the ultimate mothers and orphan stock. Uh, I don't know whether you remember. I think I'm quite a bit older than you. I'm looking at you, David. So I, you, I, I'm figure that you know. <laughs> you weren't. And uh, it, it was basically, you know, an adjunct and they were given for practical purposes, nearly an unlimited budget. And as long as they wanted to take, uh, you know, Shannon worked there in information theory, it's it, et cetera. I mean, it, it was so it, even the Big Bang, you know, the, the origins of the universe that physics talk about the evidence for the uh, uh, Big Bang came out of Bell Labs. It was an extraordinary research institute that not only set the uh, framework for all of today's technologies, but a lot of the more theoretical work that physicists do today came out of Bell Labs. And, uh, it, you know, again, the reason was it was a, a really a subsidiary of Western Electric, which was part of AT&T. And uh, AT&T was a monopoly a government regulated monopoly, which meant really all the government did was set their rate of return. And they had total control of all the communications. Now, for, I think for fairly good reasons, they decided to break up AT&T. I'm not quarreling with that. I mean, I know it was a very big payday for all the uh, uh, private equity firms, the investment bankers when they, brought, when they broke it up, but, it, it just has to disturb you to such an extent. When they broke this up, they divided AT&T into what we now, I, I think, think of as the baby bells. I don't even know whether we still think of them as that, but like Verizon, the, the current AT&T, uh, Bell South or whatever, they were all monopolies, but instead of having the United States as um, you know, their what they were as their monopoly. They had you know particular regions of the country, and they all controlled those regions. So those companies are going to not go out of business. They're not competing with anybody. Well, they did to some extent with MCI and others, but basically, they had tremendous finances. I mean, they really did. They, I don't know whether they grew, but they they had a lot of money and were virtually guaranteed of always having a lot of money. So what did the investment bankers do? They, they, when it came to Bell Labs, this company, which, you know, focused on long-term research product, products, which uh, basically revolutionized the way we communicate, the way we do so many different things. They, they made AT&T a subsidiary of the one company 
that was in the most competitive part of the uh, business of the former AT&T, Western Electric, the company that made equipment. And that company became known as Lucid. Now, I don't know whether anybody remembers Lucid, but it was a company that got very big, very fast in, in the tech bubble, which ended in 2000. Uh, I think Lucid was one of the first companies to go bankrupt. And with that, Bell Labs became a shadow of itself. It now sits someplace, I think in Scandinavia. I think it either, I think it may be actually a subsidiary, don't quote me on this, of Nokia. And you know, when we went to 5G, we didn't have 5G in this country. I mean, we, we, we still don't have any of the uh, uh, standards for 5G. I think Nokia, Bell, you know, the shadow of itself, Bell Labs, I think was probably, you know, part of the reason that we, we got up to speed on 5G. And, you know, if I had to pick one event that, you know, marked really how bad things were getting in America, it would be when we broke up AT&T and really made it impossible or made the or, or made it improbable, highly improbable that Bell Labs was ever going to be what it once was. Now, I basically believe and I think your 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 really superb documentary, The Four Horsemen. I mean, truly is superb. I'm not just saying that because I think you're a really good guy, but I mean, it is superb. Uh, you know, backs this up. Is America lost all its discipline, in my opinion, when we went off the gold standard? I think you you after that we became children in a candy store. And, and why did we need AT&T when, you know, we felt that we could solve any problem we had with money because we had the unlimited power to print as much money as we wanted. Once we went off the gold standard and the petrol uh, and, 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 and petrol oil, whatever, whatever the petrol dollar uh, became, you know, the de facto reserve currency. And uh, no, no and a child in a candy store is going to eat till he gets sick. And we have spent money until we've gotten sick and we've created. I mean, that's why I love your mission statement. I, I, I wish I was as creative as you to think of something like that. But I mean, you mentioned words in, in, in uh, when you when you were talking in the Four Horsemen. I remember very clearly and they, they resonated with me. Uh, the word integrity uh, was, was your word, if I'm not mistaken, and morality. There's none of that. It's everything's for money, and, and basically you collect, you you create it. You have to put the money somewhere, uh, and what's the most logical place to put, you know, all the money you can possibly print? You put it in the banks. That's what we did. We created massive amounts of money, and we spent it on on who knows what, on on, on crazy bureaucracies, on creating regulations, on, you know, you name it, and we spent it. And, uh, you know, America, and, you know, I'm old enough to remember, you know, America, certainly in the 60s, and we had our problems in the 60s, but there was always room for discussion. I mean, some of the young people in the 60s, and I was one of them, I mean, really did oppose the war in Vietnam. But even those discussions over the war in Vietnam do not come close to matching the kinds of discussions we have today when you... I hate to single this out, but I mean, it was one of the one of the events that really told me something was so off with America. I mean, my my, my son, who you know comes from academia, kept saying, you know, this is crazy. I'm not going to stay on the East Coast if I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach in the Midwest. I mean, I used to visit him. Uh, uh, you know, he would he, he was a postdoc at a, at, at a uh, Ivy League school. He would not eat in the town of the school because he was scared people would overhear him and he would lose his position. I'm not making this up. And, and I thought he, you know, basically, I, I, I thought he was off. Honestly, I thought that, what, what have I done? He's nuts. I mean, <laughs> what did I do wrong as a dad? It turns out dad was just too old to realize or hadn't seen how bad it had become. It was almost overnight. I think one of the critical events, I mean, I know it's it's in, in the scheme of things, it's not that much, 
But when I read an editorial or, or an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal that Amazon, which controls 75% of the book market, had banned a book on transgender. Now, it wasn't just any book. It was an extremely authoritative book that had previously been a bestseller on Amazon for several years in the transgender category. Out of nowhere, Amazon determined that this book was hate speech and they banned it. And, and, and you saw, and then I saw other things happening. Uh, uh, what was his name? Stephen Kuman wrote a book on, on, on the climate. And yeah, I'm, I'm for sustainable energies and, and, and for circular society. Obviously, I think that if our progeny or um, grandchildren, et cetera, or whatever, our nieces, nephews, I mean, if they're we're going to exist into the 21st throughout this century in the 20 we're going to need a circular economy i mean we're dealing with finite resources uh and um I, it, it's it, it it was you know really clear to me that we're not going to get there by focusing on um green making everything carbon free uh because you're going to need every bit of the fossil fuels that we have today in order to affect this transition. I mean, we're still using wood for goodness sakes. That, that was the uh, energy source that preceded coal, which preceded oil, which preceded natural gas. I mean, wood, in fact, I mean, this, you, you read these things and you don't believe them. Wood today accounts for more energy than does solar. Now, tell me how we're gonna scale up solar without using oil and without using the energy sources that are available. And then out comes this book by Stephen Kuhnman, who is as respected a scientist as you could possibly be. He, and, and the reason the book became a bestseller was called Unsettled. And I really would recommend it for people that, you know, want to know a little bit more about the climate. He is totally neutral. He worked for Obama. He was Obama's, uh, 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 climate advisor, he was science advisor. He, he had been head of the Jasons, which is a body that was set up in the wake of Sputnik to advise the president, you know, on scientific issues. Uh, and, you know, that society still stands and he, he had been head of it. He had been uh, provost at Caltech for more than a decade. He, he was just a prominent scientist. And his point in the book was not to be polemical. He wasn't trying to set up an argument. He was not trying to set up straw men. He wasn't even saying that green is, is not necessary. He believes in it. He believes we have to have a green society, but we're not gonna do it all at once. And we're gonna need the fossil fuels to do it. Well, okay, he made a very strong case. And if you wanna see how crazy this country has become, Try and find a, a look. Look at some of the reviews on this book. I mean, they are just—it's it, beyond belief. It, it, a thir, it, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to use ad hominem attacks, but brother, I mean, they were terrible. And the book was, you know, I could tell because I do follow this stuff. You know, I am an academic at heart. I'm a total nerd. And I, I mean, I, I sit at my computer all day. I'm very happy to, to work. I'll probably work until the day they carry me out, you know, to, to uh, Campbell, the uh, mortuary. The, you know, I'll be working and then at my computer. But uh, anyway, uh, they basically, this book, as I was saying, was not polemical. It wasn't setting up straw man or arguments. It was just saying, what is the case? And this was this is the only time he had anything ad hominem to say. After the United Nations, which is the agency which incidentally won the Nobel Prize for pointing out how temperatures warming, the climate, et cetera, uh, the United Nations, the same part of the United Nations that won the Nobel Prize, came out with a report, and, which he cites, and uh, report points out, well, what happens if we're wrong? And actually the world uh, heats quite a bit faster than we think it is. Let's say seven or eight degrees Fahrenheit instead of four or five or four. Let's say it's four degrees Fahrenheit more than we think it's going to be. 
what will the implications be? Will this be total destruction? Will it be a total catastrophe? No. It will basically uh, uh, lower overall long-term GDP growth. They're talking to the end of the century by, by about two-tenths of one percent. I mean, basically within a margin of error. That's what that that's what would happen if they're wrong on the side of not them the world being warmer than they expect it to be. If they haven't, you know, if they really haven't put in factors that affect everything. And he pointed this out. Basically, no effect. No, I mean, it would be not noticeable and certainly not anything. I mean, far from anything that would justify doing anything at all that would jeopardize our ability to get to this point. And the only ad hominem thing he may have said in that book, and he didn't say it by name, he said, I pointed that out. You know, I asked one of the, you know, one of the, because he knows everybody, one of the people that participated in the report, uh, the original report, what he thought of this report about the effects of climate change on the uh, world. And he said, it's really a shame that it's not going to have a bigger effect, isn't it? I mean, because he's, <laughs> I'm not making this up. I mean, this is the, this is of the world we live in, where we ban books that, that, that are meant to help transgender people. When you have these operations, et cetera, almost no one ends up happy with them. And, and, and now you can do them as 10 year olds. And, and, and what we're doing with climate change, we're short circuiting our ability to do it. Now, how did Amazon uh, react to this? I'll tell you how they reacted. And this I can't verify. I can't say they definitely banned a book on, on uh, transgender. But in this case, well, I don't want to, you know, say trans, you know, what they did to the trans, what they did with transgender was serious enough because people suffer from this stuff. They really do. They absolutely suffer in so many ways. But anyway, in, in, in this case, this book came out and it came out from a, you know, a kind of a boutique press, but a very respectable press that can certainly up their printings. And the book sold out immediately. Mm -hmm. I never would have heard of the book had I not read an interview on one of the foreign websites that I uh, watch, that, that I pay attention to, Asian Times. Right. And I did, did an interview with him and I went to Amazon. It was probably a week after the book had come out and I wanted to get the book. Not available. Sold out. Now, I will tell you this. I ordered two or three copies of the book because uh, I want one for me and a couple to give away. Uh, it was two months, I think, before I got my first copy. What all they could do at that point, this is my speculation. Everything I've said up to now is not speculation, but I figure all they could do at that point, the book was out. No one expected it to be a bestseller. I think it was a bestseller because when people saw the guy had worked for Obama, they jumped on it because, you know, Obama's, a, you know, a sacred name now, you know, among a, a good chunk of, uh, you know, people on, on the media. And, uh, the book just sold, just sold, and they, they basically tried to control the damage it was going to do to their agenda. That's my theory about it. And, you know, and what you see, I'll just leave you with one more example, because I know I've been talking like a singer sewing machine right now. I mean, just going on and on. But I just have to mention this to you, because I talked to somebody the other day who who, who had been an elite swimmer. And I don't know whether you've been following this case at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Actually, I'm a Wharton graduate, which is part of the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, it, it, this is just, I mean, in a sense, it's heartbreaking, but it, it, but it, it is so, it, it's unbelievable that this is happening in America. There was a, the, the, the Penn swim team. I don't know whether they're competitive or not competitive, but you know, I'm told by, you know, elite swimmers, that they train for, you know, four or five hours a day, you know, to gain an extra tenth of a second. Now, all of a sudden, someone on this on the on this pen, pen, women's pen swim team is beating people not by a quarter of a second or even a second, five seconds, you know, a hundred times fat, you know, more than there was before. Who is this person? Who is this woman that all of a sudden 
has just moved to number one female swimmer in not only on the Penn team, but in the world, I mean, in the country and plans to try out for the Olympics in 2024, the Summer Olympics. Well, it was a guy who got uh, some hormone shots and he maintained, he has all his uh, female, his, his male parts. It wasn't any kind of operation. And I mean, I just have to repeat an interview, which was not on Twitter, any advertisement about this guy. I mean, the Missouri Senator, Senator, Senatorial candidate from Missouri put on a Twitter ad out and the ad was banned and she was banned. And it wasn't even an anti-transgender ad. It was just saying, this is not fair. Here is a guy now who is sharing the locker room with the women uh, that, that, that swim. And one of the women was interviewed. They all have to be interviewed anonymously. And, you know, and they all have to say, or they're thrown off the team if they really complain about it. And, and her comment, what got me, yes, it's, you know, it, it's, it's very discouraging. I mean, you know, here we've worked all our lives to, you know, get to a certain time and along comes somebody uh, with a few shots. And he's beating us by five seconds. And he's the number one swimmer in the world. As a male, he was number 475 or something. But as a female, he's number one in the world. And, and it's, you know, what, what it's also very embarrassing in, in the locker rooms because he has all his male parts and, and you can tell he likes women. And, and, and I mean, you know, without repeating, that, that's all she said. And I'm, I'm inferring from that, which I think other people would infer. But, uh, you know, but this is America. And this is, I wish this were some sort of extraordinary story that was not, you know, I could go on and on about this stuff. And I never believed this was happening, but it was. And, and it's what we've turned into. It's what Facebook has done to us. It was what, you know, they, they've brainwashed us. We're a brainwashed country right now to, to, to an extent that I never thought was possible. And, you know, I think what turned me from a, a business student into a uh, either a lawyer or a psych or either a lawyer or a businessman. Thank goodness I'm not. I mean, I always refused to join the financial industry. But what turned me into uh, a, a partially someone who really can accept this. It, it were, were the Milgram experiments that I studied in college. They had just come out and those, those were the uh, experiments that showed it doesn't take much to make people obey authority, almost nothing. Mm -hmm. People walking around a lab in a white coat can tell you to shock another person even past the point where he may be either critically injured or even dead but they will continue to follow orders of the experimenter. Uh, and you know, the problem with the experiment is there was no control group. Everybody did it. Some people stopped a lot earlier, but you know, they didn't go to the part, part where they were really inflicting tremendous harm. The real crazy part of it was that the people, the experimenters, the people that actually participated, the person that they were experimenting on was a student. She wasn't you know, in any kind of pain. But the people that were participating never got over it. They never, you know, they were never able to really fully accept what they had done because of a type of brainwashing. And what you saw in that experiment writ small is what you're seeing in America writ large. The only people that are benefiting from all this money that we are spending is the financial industry. And, and I don't even know whether it's, you, you know, you can blame them individually. I mean, it's just that they think this is right. When I grew up, what was right is that whenever you did a transaction, both parties benefited right. in their own separate way. And one statistic, which I think you'll really appreciate, is uh, I've updated it through 2022. Over the last 22 years, what do you think has been the best performing accessible asset. I'm not talking about some sort of rare, you know, earth metal or something like that, but of assets that can be easily bought. What do you think has been the best performing and not by, by not by a small margin, by a large margin? And I'm including the S&P 500 dividends reinvested over the past 22 years. What do you think has been the best performing asset? 
Well, I know that Gold's had a compounded annual growth rate, a CAGR of about 10% from 2000. That is it. Say no more. You guessed it. You're one of the very, very few. Yes, gold has outperformed. Silver also has outperformed, but not by nearly as much as gold. Silver will have its day. Silver, you know, is a little bit easier to control than gold. But I mean, now, what finance, you know, of these financial institutions, uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, you name them, the ones that manage trillions and, and all the capital for the uh, uh, retirement funds, et cetera. None of them will recommend gold. It's not part of their for portfolio. I mean, you still see, I mean, I saw a headline, I think two weeks ago on, on Bloomberg, you know, bond market makes it more difficult to justify 60-40 and 60-40 means that people should basically have a portfolio that's 60 percent stocks and 40 percent bonds if you're studying for a cpa certified uh not, not, not cpa certified not financial net certified financial planner cfp all these initials uh which somebody that advises people you flunk the test if you say something positive about gold you're not supposed to advise anybody that gold should be in their portfolio. Yet this has out, gold has outperformed everything for 22 years. It's hard now to call gold a bar, barbarous relic, which is what Charlie Munger did. And I, I trust Charlie Munger. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised that when Warren Buffett steps down from Berkshire Hathaway, if you find that company has massive amounts of silver and gold stored in vaults all over the world, it would not, you know, Buffett one time almost cornered the silver market. And he 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 had uh they but they outed him <laughs> they they found out and then he 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 stepped he walked it back but i think we talked about this before but anyway i'm done david i mean there is no integrity in this country as far as the financial institutions go and, and, and basically the financial institutions serve themselves which means that they make themselves richer and i think that you know the the, the grand the, the incredible inequalities that you're seeing I mean, I think with what we're seeing now with food inflation and energy inflation, I mean, this is not going to bother. Do you think Jeff Bezos cares whether he pays $30 a gallon for gasoline or, or, or 30 cents? I mean, really, it, it could matter. But if you're making 50 grand a year and, and, and you have to drive 20 miles to work, this is a tremendous handicap. And when you walk into the grocery store, all of a sudden things are, you know, they'll try and hide it. You know, they'll lower the amount of quantity that they're giving you, but it's 40, 40% more. It really is. And the meat that you get, I don't eat meat anymore. Now, maybe that's a placebo effect. Maybe I'm just convinced that it's not as good as it was, but whatever the reasons, I, I, I find it very, you know, you just see this stuff happening in front of you. And so how does the Fed react? Well, a quarter point hike and, and no change in the amount of of money. I mean, they, still, they have this $9 trillion balance sheet and they're hiking in the interest rates a quarter of a point. And, and the Financial Times is saying that they're getting very tough on inflation. I mean, it's <laughs> literally... They, He's become a hawk. He, 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 no, but they, they said his inner Volker showed itself. You know, Volker was the guy that did inner crush Volker. inflation. Yes. His inner Volker is showing itself. This is like, I mean, you can't make this up. And the whole thing, if it weren't so tragic, it'd be a Saturday night live routine. It really would. And, and I, I think you share this. I mean, you know, your your mission statement, you know, you, you recognize that there's no integrity in, in what's the most important industry in this country. How far can we go? I mean, we have to either learn to cooperate and this war, I don't want to get started or else you'll never get me off on, on, on what, 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 what you're hearing about the war. I mean, yes, the Russians are doing absolutely horrible things. I mean, everybody knows that. The question is why and whatever else is happening, you know, and, sure. you know, that's a very, very big issue. But anyway, I'm sorry, David, I didn't mean to go off. You can edit me oh, out. If you all want. good. So I think we could go ahead and wrap it up there. I'm going to do a couple of uh, footnotes here. Number one, that uh, Steve was referring to the Four Horsemen. That's the film that uh, yours truly was in, along with a lot of other people. 
and it's available for free on YouTube. It's called The Four Horsemen Film. And if you want to find it on my website, just go to the About tab, scroll down on the About tab, and there's a direct link. You just click the button, and you will be watching the movie. And then I don't the trust time, Google. David, let me just interrupt you. I don't trust Google. So, I mean, and I don't trust Amazon either, but I, I, I prefer to pay for it. I figured that if they somehow edited it, I could, you know, they would have right. a harder time. But yes, it's available everywhere. And it's recognized as a super, I mean, just it's tremendous documentary. I'm sorry for interrupting, but no, it means. No. And the other thing I wanted to make a little bit of a footnote on was superconductivity. Uh, for people that don't know, you can look up the word on Google or search engine. But line loss, when you are transmitting power over these big transmission lines, it's what's called line loss. So if you're putting out, you know, 100,000 units, by the time it gets to the destination, it might be at 70,000, meaning you've lost 30%. Mm -hmm. Whereas with superconductivity, you don't lose it. You get 100,000 units, you get at the beginning and 100,000 units at the end of the line. And this would be like increasing the... Um, you know, the amount of power by 30% or so. So it's a huge boom to the economy. And yet, as you said, 20 years have gone by and nothing's really happened. I just have to make a footnote because I was in mainland China only once, Steve. I was only there, I don't want to lie, I think it was about 10 days. It was a whirlwind. I went and visited a few mining projects and I also talked to Civic Bank and I talked to some of their top dogs as far as the resource sector was concerned at the Mining Bureau. I don't want to talk too long, but um, one of the main features they really wanted to know was what my thoughts were on superconductivity. And that was probably almost 20 years ago. And was I, did I think that the non-sub-zero superconductivity was going to take place or not? And I said, yeah, I think it will, but I didn't know. And they're also very interested in recycling. They wanted to know why we were so wasteful in the West to be in our silver in the landfills, right? Because they don't waste anything in China. So I don't want to go drone on and on, but uh, one, I want to thank you for coming on board. I think next time we can just talk on the metals a little bit more because I know you've got some very interesting ideas on the silver market and the gold market as well. We I, I, I think that. silver, just very briefly, David, um, I mean, the only problem silver has, it's too good. It's both a monetary metal and, and one of the best industrial metals there is, period. Um, and there's no around the corner from silver. There's no you know, real substitute in, in certain projects. I mean, gold is excellent conductor. It, it has all those same properties, but not nearly to the degree silver has. And there are just some applications that are impossible without silver, and those are critical. But I mean, we can save that. I mean, but yeah, yeah. I, I've spent well, hours and hours going through. through. I just have to make point. I'm sorry. I mean, because you keep reminding me of, of stuff that I've read, even doing this, this kind of political correctness that we're seeing today. You know, I you know, I, I did a PhD. I did, did a lot. I love research. That's my passion, research. I'm not, I don't know whether I'm particularly good or bad at it, but I just love doing it. And uh, even the science magazines, uh, and I'm talking about nature and science, which are the two best magazines in the Western world today. I don't trust them anymore. I mean, some of the comments they made on, on, on silver were, were, were just crazy. I mean, they, they were talking about, uh, um, I'll look it up for, for, for our next discussion. And I'll actually, I'll try and get a copy of, of the article. But they were making comments that, that they were just fantastic, not believable. I mean, a, a layman like me, I'm not so bright that I would understand all the ins and outs of silver. But, I, you know, I, I can convert A to B and things like that. And enough to realize that they were talking about the amount of photovoltaics we could, you know, create would would probably be a hundred orders of magnitude greater than what's going to be possible. Yeah. And I'll, I'll leave it for next time. But let me just I mean, you just I never dreamed I'd be in a world where I, I basically have to I can't trust the science magazines anymore. I really can't. I mean, it's gotten that bad. 
it, it, it really has. Something has to change. Some wake up call. We are desperate for a wake up call. And maybe we're going to get it. Maybe this war will be a, a, a catalyst for a wake up call, because if America gets back to where it once was, there's a lot more hope for humanity than there would be if America just stays the way it is. I mean, let me I mean, whatever. Agreed. Agreed. So, well, Steve, leave. It's been a it's been an interesting conversation. I will have you back. Definitely. We'll go down more on the metals. Great insights, you know, from the Bell Labs to Lucent to climate change to transgender. I mean, you touched a lot of topics. And you know, <laughs> right? Going back to the movie, when I said, and for those that don't know, I mean, I told you where the movie came from, and to the best of my recollection on that, and I didn't know about MAGA back then. I mean, this movie's fairly old. I talked about what made America great. This is before that became. A yes, movie. but it was I so current. America great wasn't the best food and the best restaurants or the best books or the best clothing. What made right. America great was we all had integrity. Yes. And, and that's what made it great. It wasn't what we produced. It was our inner being that we could communicate really well and live our word and meet the contract. And if we didn't, there was a price to pay. So the agreements were had integrity involved. And uh, I have to just comment to you, I know this is, our audience will see this, but um, my dear sister watched the movie with her boyfriend uh, pretty much after it came out. And Larry said to my sister, David looked like he was kind of angry when he said that about what used to be what made America great in the past. You know? well, I, I just make one quick comment. When I saw the movie was dated 2012, I think that's what it was. Yeah. And I said, well, this is an old documentary. I'm not sure I really want to watch it. I, I was stunned, just stunned at how perceptive it was and how accurate and how incredibly it, it, it displayed what's going on exactly today. I mean, it was so it, it, it was it was more than prophetic. It was descriptive. I mean, precisely descriptive of, you know, exactly what's happening today. And, and, and it is so I mean, it shows you the genesis. I mean, you know, that's why, you know, integrity. I remember that. I mean, it made an impression on me. I mean, I think now in those terms that you cannot you, you have to have something you believe in that's apart from what's going on around you in order to maintain your freedom. There's no freedom in this country anymore. Forget about it. You cannot have freedom under these circumstances. I'm sorry, David, but I just had to echo no. how good your documentary was. It was so good. It really was. Okay. It really was. Well, we will sign off here and I will have you back and uh, I'm sure we will have much more to talk about the next time. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Thanks, David. It was such a pleasure. It really was. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, See you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.